Welcome to Four C's One Family. I'm your host, James Thomas. I, I'm doing something special, something different here. We have a guest coming to us from Canada. He's a Taiwan national. And uh, we're, we're going to talk about something interesting that's pretty much related to, to Taiwan, but also in, to the world in general. I'm speaking with Mr. Daniel Chen. He's a Taiwan national uh, studying in Canada, and he's an engineer. He's what they would call a nuclear power engineer. And so just say a quick welcome to Daniel. How you doing? How you doing? Hi. Hi, James. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for waking up in the morning over there. It's uh, a little <laughs> bit after eight o'clock here at night, and we're exactly 12 hours apart. How are you feeling today? Um, so far, so good, I guess. Oh, that, that's so simple. So <laughs> look, real, you know, real quick, uh, where's, where's, uh, what part of Taiwan are you from? Just give everybody a little rundown here. Uh, I am, yeah, I, uh, I am your knees. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm from Elan. And oh, although I, ever since, uh, college, ever since my college years, I've been basically living in Taipei and, uh, well, now I'm in Canada. So now, yeah. <laughs> how do you end up, uh, you know, heading abroad to study and stuff like that you know your english is, is very good i'm kind of jealous you know my chinese <laughs> is, has fallen to the ground because you know i think i speak too much english i don't know but uh how does english get so good man uh well it's kind of simple my dad pursued uh studies in britain when i was six to nine years old i feel it, mm -hmm. it's it's pretty formative years i feel um english is uh in many ways the first Actually, it is the first language that I learned to read and write. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, in many ways, I, yeah, that, that's that's also where my weird accent comes from. <laughs> is that right? How good is your Chinese? <laughs> How oh, good is your Mandarin? Oh, oh, no. uh, you speak Chinese? Okay, la. Uh, okay, la. Okay, la. Okay, la. Well... <laughs> So, so, so tell, tell the viewers, what are you studying now? What are you studying specifically? Because I want to talk a little bit about that topic and how it, it relates to what's going on here in Taiwan. Yeah, so uh, I study nuclear engineering. Um, that is what my field is called here in uh, at Ontario Tech, which is what I'm studying. Uh, I understand that that's not the case back home which is um, part of the reason why uh, I pursue studies abroad rather than at Tsinghua. And uh, maybe this, this is somewhat interesting. Maybe we, we will talk about it later. Okay. So what, what, what got you hooked into the, you know, the, the sciences or the engineering field as far as relates to uh, nuclear power? Why is that? Because, you know, nuclear is an issue out here. It is. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I guess uh, my interest in my interest in science is pretty innate. Uh, I've been interested in the science and math and engineering for as long as I can remember, I suppose. And I had a very dim view of politics, which uh, I guess, long story short, it got me in trouble. As a high school <laughs> student, I was um, very. Uh, I, I care a lot, a lot about the environment, about climate change, and um, I got into mechanical engineering at Taita to mm -hmm. build wind turbines. Uh, but then there was, uh, when I graduated high school, uh, but before I got into college, I attended this, um, essentially it's a summer camp for ner nerdy Asian kids. <laughs> and one of the... <laughs> And uh, one of the speakers was um, an astrophysicist called Chi Shasen. And um, his talk wasn't about astrophysics when I got there. It was about nuclear energy. And what impressed me at the time actually wasn't what he was saying about nuclear energy, but what he was saying about wind power, which is that... Um, you can carpet the entire surface of the world in wind turbines and we're not providing enough power. 
because the issue isn't that there isn't enough wind turbines. The issue is that there isn't enough wind. <laughs> oh, and that had that troubled me a lot to say the least. You know, uh, you know, I picked mechanical engineering as a as my um, study topic because I wanted to get into that, and so. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a life changing moment. I needed to, yeah, I decided that, oh, well, if wind, I guess long story short, uh, it took me a few years, but I thought that if wind energy isn't going to do it, I might as well look at this weird nuclear energy that he was talking about. And, mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, I fell in love with the technology. And I feel like that is something which we'll get into, but I feel like it's something that if I had even been slightly more aware of the politics around nuclear energy at the time, I might not have made that choice simply because of how hard it was going to be. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Now let's hold the, little, the horses back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you pursue that topic then right here in good, you know, Taiwan, you know, why, why specifically? I mean, you mentioned something slightly about, you know, you don't, you don't want to get mm -hmm. into politics, but, you know, it has been politicized, you know, here. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, I hope, without getting either of us in trouble. But, <laughs> but, but um, you know, why didn't you, you know, just hunker down here and say, okay, I, I, I want to do it here. I want to study it here. Well, firstly, I want to uh, correct you. If I may, um, no, of course you may that, not do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it isn't that I'm not going to get into politics. In fact, I'm going to get into politics a lot in this talk. Uh, I was okay. merely saying that as a young, naive engineer, I didn't want to touch it um, to my detriment, perhaps. Yeah. At but, that, you um, mean at that specific time? At, at that specific, specific time. time, yeah. But oh. um, the sort of my uh i wouldn't really call it a political awakening i but i but it's sort of when i re realized that the problems associated with the nuclear isn't really the problems that i thought it was was actually in 2014 and uh everybody re probably remembers that 2014 we had the uh sunflower movement the town mm -hmm. uh People probably still remember, though it's less often talked about, that right after, like two weeks after um, the student movement ended, uh, Ling Yixiong had a nuclear anti-nuclear hunger strike. And that was, again, where you had like hundreds of thousands of people literally on the streets calling for nuclear plant four to be shut down. And uh, I didn't understand that. I thought that mm -hmm. it was... Uh, firstly, it was shocking. Um, I, I didn't realize that sort of nuclear engineering can draw this kind of ire from the Taiwanese public. And also, um, I later realized was very important, but I thought, I only thought was interesting at the time was that it came directly after the, um, student movement. And in fact, that later I found out these two events are related somehow. And also just, uh, I guess at the time it was also when I started realizing that the Taiwanese pro nuclear movement itself was also in, it is in disarray. And in many ways that is because the Taiwanese nuclear establishment itself was in disarray. And I sort of wanted to, hmm, I sort of wanted to find out why. I suppose. Mm -hmm. And I, I figured out that, and I figured out that it was uh, very much, hmm, nuclear energy is very deeply connected to um, the politics and development of Taiwan, right? So back in the uh, 60s and the 70s, uh, there was the, there was, a huge boom in Taiwanese economics. Um, you know, people call it the Taiwanese economic miracle. And nuclear energy was pretty um, was pretty important for that because um, you know energy is important. And at the time, sort of near, so in the beginning of the eighties, actually, like sixty percent of electricity in Taiwan was generated using nuclear power. 
Uh, but also it, mm, in many ways, it fed into this, um, the propaganda that the Kuomintang had, that, had at the time and still do right now that, um, they were the, they were the sort of, um, I guess, sort of the ra more rational level headed, um, sort of better for economic types. I suppose, and that nuclear energy was kind of a symbol of that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and that was a pretty power. That is honestly a pretty powerful story, right? It's like you want to, you know, in many ways, it's kind of like modern China at the time. You have you have a, a government. They aren't, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of authoritarian, but they made you rich, and so you sort of. People sort of accepted it at the time, I suppose. And mm -hmm. so this persisted all the way until sort of 1986. And 1986, um, in eight, yes, April, in April 1986, um, you know, there, there was a nuclear accident in Chernobyl. And what happened was that in Taiwan was that these various, um, pro democracy activists kind of, um, saw this as saw this as an opportunity i suppose because you know advocating for democracy i suppose is difficult if no one at the time understood what it was and the pro democracy activists at the time kind of said that oh well we can't tell you what democracy is but we can tell you what it's supposed to prevent and it is supposed to prevent these kinds of um very opaque systems of governance uh, making decisions that they aren't explaining to the people and causing a lot of harm, right? Well, I, I want to hold, let me, let me pull back a little bit on this type. You know, I'm well, from, you know, Nueva York, you know, New York City. And, you know, there's always, mm -hmm. there's a lot of prevalence of, uh, you know, time, mm -hmm. ta Taiwan picking up the, the side of the leftist universe in, in the United States that can, can mm -hmm. be, considered uh, not suitable for the development or the current social political situation in, in Taiwan. Now, this is something, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, I come from, I come from a time where, um, you know, Greenpeace is, you know, just pushing power, you know, uh, yeah. and, and I understood because, you know, I was being, this is what I learned in school. You know, I, I, I care about the environment, you know, I've seen, I've seen temperatures change because of different uh, countries and nations I worked in and stuff like that. I've seen the effect mm -hmm. and um, you know, I, I cared so much about the environment and, and all I heard about in, in my schooling, especially stateside was nuclear waste. What are we going to do with it? You know, oh. what are we going to do it? You know, no, no, hold on. I mean, I, I, this, this is me. You know, I, I would consider myself, you know, at this point in time, you know, very fearful of, nuclear power that word nuclear it, it, you know what's so funny the word new clear the dispelling of the word is even scary you know and you then we have clear you know that's that's scary and when you see a uh, a picture of a of a, a nuclear bomb exploding someplace you know that molotov cocktail going up and things are just going just going forever they're, they're just cleared out that's kind of scary and that's you know stuck with me in my childhood you know <laughs> and People like you have a whole different, more calmer approach to it. And, and, and this is the reason why I want to speak to you, because, you know, I worry about what are we going to do with the waste? Mm. Well, that waste is going to be around for a couple of uh, uh, millions of years, possibly. Or what are we going to put it in the middle of Nevada? Uh, does Taiwan have the space? Can Taiwan handle nuclear mm -hmm. waste? Now, what happens if there's... A, a, a quarter of a, of a mini Chernobyl that's happening here. You know, um, I come from a time here in Taiwan when um, General Electric was really, you know, to, the job to, to go after, you know. So this is my background and this is a person you're talking to. So how are you going to calm me down? Ah, well. This is it. That's a very complicated question, I suppose. And I'm a complicated person. <laughs> of course. Um, we all are. Uh, I guess... In many ways, I, maybe I don't want to calm you down. Uh, oh, maybe I want to make you angry. <laughs> I don't know, but well, that's that's quite easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I get angry easily. I'm, I tend to make people angry pretty easily. So, who knows? Um, 
there's a lot of things that you touched upon. Uh, you talked about waste. You talked about nuclear weapons. You talked about GE, and I and I guess um, from GE, what you were trying to talk about was sort of the, um, I guess, uh, unfair structures of power, maybe economic, both both sort of economic and foreign policy, international, I suppose. And in many cases, all of those things are true, I suppose. And so that's a very, that's a question I'm going to have to take some time answering. And uh, yeah, let's talk about the easy thing. Um, okay. First, uh, the waste itself as sort of a technical scientific issue, what it is, what it does. So one of the things that really drew me into nuclear um, energy uh, back in the day was um, the story from uh, there, there are sort of two versions of this, both um, both kind of related. The first is that, you know, is that the is that a lump of uranium the size of your fist, right? Powers you for your entire lifetime, right? Wow. And that's not just sort of keeping your lap, keeping your lights on, and running your laptop. And it is it also um, includes the energy that you will use in your car, the energy you use to make your car. You had to use to build your house, right? Just sort of all those things aggregate the average onto you. That is how much that's how powerful it is. And you know, one fistful of nuclear one one fistful of um of uh, uranium generates one fistful of waste, right? And so it isn't really much when you talk about things that last that will last you for a lifetime, right? The volume is very small, and in many ways it makes uh I guess. From a technical perspective, it makes things easy. From a political perspective, it makes things very difficult. And why is why why is this so then? Because right now you're just dropping bombs all over the place. This is like you said in a minefield. You know, you're <laughs> telling me a fistful of uranium can last, you know, you a lifetime, a typical life life a lifetime. You say up eighty yeah. years old, right? We talking yeah. about we talk about the energy equals the yeah. waste. We talk about power for your house, your laptop, your cell phone, yeah. uh, your bus fare, and all that stuff. What do yeah. we do with the waste, man? Because you know the world's full of billions of people. You know what I'm saying? Where, where, where do we go from here? I mean, this is what are we going to do with that waste? Because that waste is going to be around a long time and a lot, a lot longer than anybody we know. Yeah, and that is sort of the difficult. That is sort of the technologically and politically difficult part, I suppose. The technologically. And so sort of they're, they're kind of the same thing, really. So uh, let's not talk about nuclear energy for a min minute. Let's talk about coal, right? Okay. Um, coal emits a lot of waste as well. And in fact, a lot of radioactive waste, right? Now it is, yes, it, it's not called that. Um, oh, okay, have, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. It is not okay. called that. Um, they have a name for it. It's called naturally occurring radioactive materials, or NORM for short, right? Yeah. So it's a really nice name. It doesn't yeah. create it doesn't create nuclear waste. It creates norms. <laughs> but sort of okay. the um, but sort of uh, first of all, where it comes from is the fact that um, radiation and radioactive substances are natural. Right, we we dig uranium out of the ground. It's not something that we create. We created through weird science, right? And so, radioactive materials are natural, and they occur as um, impurities, essentially, in all manner of uh, rocks and dirt and ore and even coal. Right now, the coal um, now to get the same amount of energy from coal as you would from your fistful of um, uranium, you need um, literally 50 million times as much coal, right? Repeat so, that again now. 50 million, right? So this is how much uranium will last you for a lifetime. If you want to use coal, then that's 50 million of these, Ooh. which is a lot. Yeah. So... Basically, uh, if, if you want some, something a bit more intuitive, I suppose, it'd be like the, it'd be roughly the weight of the entire population of type of uh, Taipei, roughly. <laughs> yeah. And so 
but going back to what I was saying about Cole, sort of um, the even if within Cole, sort of one one thousandth of that is the is the norm, right? The the radioactive waste that we don't call that, right? That's a lot more. That's a lot more waste that is created by the uranium, and it isn't. You know, and it isn't being kept in, it isn't being sealed in containers. It just goes out the smokestack, right? Out of sight, out of mind, essentially. Okay, I get that. I get that. But I'm talking about Mm -hmm. the potency Mm -hmm. of the pollutants. You know, Mm -hmm. there there's stuff that we can say that's poisonous to us, but Mm -hmm. the detrimental the detrimental effects from it lasts Mm -hmm. over certain periods, maybe shorter. Of of course, I rather if we if we have to make waste. I hope I, mm-hmm. I, I, I'd rather be around waste that's going to, uh, mm-hmm. how would you say, become mute after a, a, a mm-hmm. short amount of time. But we're talking about nuclear power, Daniel. We're talking about nuclear power waste, man. That stays around for billions of years. We can't, like, just shoot them off on one of Tesla's rocket ships t- to Mars, man. That's scary to me. I mean, please forgive my ignorance. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well... Firstly, you mentioned that billions of years, and uh, that number varies a lot. <laughs> okay. And kind of the kind of the reason why, and is um, one of the tricky things about talking about nuclear engineering is that uh, radiation doesn't doesn't end; it sort of decays, it peters out to nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, how long that? And so, how long that two billion years? How long that how long it um, needs to be stored depends on how close you need to peter it to nothing, I suppose. And, okay, but can, can you turn that into a little peter it to nothing? What do you mean? How I mean, how what do you, you can you can you add substances to it that could uh, cause it cause it to you know slowly become less uh, 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 dangerous? Uh, the, the nuclear material become less. Um, detrimental to the environment and people? Or is it something like that? Or what do you mean by that? Yes, you can. But that comes into the other part that is um, technologically easy and politically very hard. Um, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, this, is okay. a, this is a tight rope for me. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, it sort, of peter, it, it sort of peters out to nothing over time. And as you said, sort of, uh, is there anything we can do to make the petering faster? And the answer isn't really that you put something in, you take something away. Now, um, it, 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 it kind of works like this. The, nu- the nuclear waste as it is, um, nine, sort of uh, roughly 95% of it, of nuclear waste is... Um, Inert material, it is uranium that hasn't actually reacted at all. Okay. Right. And so it's uranium that isn't like, it's very slightly radioactive. It is, uh, it is only as radioactive as the stuff you took out of the ground. It's not substantially more dangerous. Right. Got it. Now, of the remaining 5%, um, about half of that is what we call fission products. Those are the fragments that's left after the uranium has undergone a nuclear reaction. Those things are extremely radioactive, but they aren't radioactive for very long. So you're talking about storing those things for um, for a handful of decades, maybe, which is oh, not very long. Tricky, <laughs> tricky, but not like, like tricky, but not undoable. Now, the stuff that um, really gets on people's nerves for all kinds of reasons, not just the one that you mentioned, is um, the is the other half of the five percent, uh, which is goes by many names. is sometimes called minor actinides, uh, and essentially what that is is that um, while in the while in the nuclear reactor, the some of the uranium turns into plutonium, right? And that is um, that is not. It is more radioactive than the uranium. It is substantially less radioactive than the fission products, but it also lasts a lot longer. Those you need to store for um, maybe tens of thousands of years before it before the radiation sort of peters to uh, acceptable levels. 
Now, uh, of course, one of the thing, interesting things you can do with plutonium is that you can extract it and you can put it back into the reactor, right? And then it turns in, and then uh, you know, it turns into the fission products, which I actually mentioned earlier is extremely radioactive, but it isn't radioactive for very long. And so, you, so you, 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 you not, I'm sorry, but you and I must have a different interpretation. Of what is long, <laughs> you know, because you know we, you, you know, we have a. Uh, 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 a space problem in the world. The, the population is getting mm -hmm. so large. You know, mm -hmm. we got to worry about where people are going to be living, mm -hmm. uh, where we're going to grow crops, and and you know, land acquisition is coming so hard. You know, land is mm -hmm. getting expensive and stuff like that. I mean, you know, there's mm -hmm. there's there's, there's going to be a limit that you know we have to deal with. It. It's not like like we can have space everywhere. I mean, Taiwan doesn't have a lot of space. I mean, you know. This is something that 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 bothers me and, and still does. You know, sorry if, that, if mm -hmm. I'm rattling your, your your chain here a little bit, but this is something that no. needs to be dumbified a little bit to, for people like us. I, I do understand mm -hmm. um, on a science basic, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the adding and, and you know electrons. Mm -hmm. and I, I do understand that, but this is the fear because some things can get uncontrollable when when things. Are put in the hands of people to control, especially something that we need to mm -hmm. store away for millions of years. I mean, that's a lot of life cycles, and it doesn't take much for one person to slip up, right? So, you know, dumb it, dumb it down for me a little bit, man. No, sure. Um, well, like I mentioned, sort of the sort of optimally, right? Optimally, um, your fistful of nuclear waste is. Mm -hmm. 2.5% of things that actually need to be disposed and gotcha. doesn't need to be disposed um, for too long, right? Half a human, I mean, half a human lifetime, that isn't, you know, I, I feel like that isn't too much to ask. You you need to house yourself for, you need to house yourself for twice as long as that. Yeah. And also mm -hmm. there is a lot more of you to house, right? Yeah. You... Um, you are, are the weight of one person, right? This is um, sort of the waste itself is the is um, depending on depending on how you want to do things is either the size of your fist or what five percent of the size of your fist, right? Gotcha. And so, in many ways, um, you know, Taiwan has enough has basically enough space to house all its people, and therefore, it's going to be able to house. Um, it is. It is more. It has more than adequate enough space to house the, the nuclear waste that these people are going to be generating. Are you also adding in the mm -hmm. perception of being able to make part of the waste recyclable? That kind of like lessens the the uh, size restraints, the uh, limitations needed because the you know the plutonium you can put it back in the reactor. Yes, uh, which is you know are you are you putting that in your comp compilation here? That would certainly be preferable, and I really want to do it. But that goes to the part where I said that this is where nuclear is extremely politically difficult, which is actually taking the plutonium out. And uh, I guess, long story short, unless you want to sort of dive deep into this, um, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, Taiwan is not allowed to do that on paper. Most countries in the world um, are essentially shadow banned, I guess is the term that cool kids use. They're shadow banned from doing that kind of thing. And in fact, uh, the US hates other countries doing it so much that they shadow ban themselves from doing it. Okay, now who shall I slap for example. doing this? Who shall I walk up on stage and slap for doing this? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if he's still alive, but uh, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Oh, I like. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's still alive, I, man. I'm, I'm a fan of Jimmy Carter, but uh, yeah, but that's me personally. But yeah, yeah. go back. Will you, yeah, go, go, mm -hmm. go, go into that a little bit. Yeah, go into that. Sure. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna be blunt. Sort of the reason why, uh, why most countries in the world are not allowed to do what I said. Sort of just extract all the usable parts out of nuclear, still usable parts out of nuclear waste, and then just dispose of the tiny problematic part is because, well, uh, plutonium, in addition to releasing energy in a nuclear reactor, it can also release energy um, in cities as bombs, 
and mm. the powers that be, and by the powers that be, I mean the yeah, the Ooh. countries that already have nuclear weapons essentially kind of don't want other countries being able to do that. Now, um, this is this is heavy, man. This is heavy. This is one of those red line situations. Yeah. You know that, right? Yes. Uh, I'm going to get you in trouble. I'm going to get all of us in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not trying, but this is, I don't hear this much. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard this before, but I don't read about mm -hmm. it in the paper. I don't. And in many cases, I suppose, and sort of what happened was that uh, it was the 70s. The uh, It was the 70s. We had a huge, huge oil crisis in 1973. And everybody was trying to sort of wean themselves off oil. And the US in particular wanted to pursue uh, nuclear energy. And they did a lot of uh, very interesting and meaningful scientific work on that. Uh, however, one of the things that they discovered was, uh, first of all, that uh, there is a lot more uranium in the U.S. than they previously assumed, and uh, the and so you know there's still a lot of waste to deal with. But what the U.S. was primarily concerned about at the time was that the plutonium was going to run out. Uh, sorry, the uranium is going to run out, run and out. so um, sort of extracting usable fuel out of the waste was important. And now it kind mm -hmm. of isn't because they, they have a lot more uranium than they thought that they had. And so, uh -huh. and also, and so what Jimmy Carter did at the time essentially was, okay, well, since we don't need this reprocessing, we don't need to recycle our waste anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, we are not going to do it. And we are also going to discourage everyone else that we can from doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to not set a bad example. And uh, okay. it's kind of, it's one of those uh, interesting things, uh, interesting in quotes. Well, yeah, but but uh, you can understand why though. I mean, if I, now that I'm look, I, I back off and, and, you know, a little bit and understand why, you know, that will enable some naughty parties to do some naughty things. So maybe, or it can become a, a market commodity maybe for some nations, who knows? Well, it has to be said that um, you want to do naughty things, there are easier ways of doing that. Um, the sort of what, what I said about making bombs out of nuclear waste is um, sort of from the science, it's doable. Uh, from in practical terms, it is, it is, it is somewhat tricky. There are easier ways of doing it. And in fact, you know, you look at all nine countries, what I call the nuclear nine, right? All nine countries that currently have nuclear weapons, none of them got nuclear weapons from playing with their civilian program. And in fact, all of them got their nuclear weapons before they got a civilian program. Right. Oh, man, that's, that's a trip. That's a trip. That's a trip. Yeah. That's, a, that's a trip. <laughs> before they got their civilian programs. Yeah. And it's very much the case that sort of Jimmy Carter did this because uh, to sort of set a good example. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the example is particularly good because the U S didn't get rid of its nuclear program. Certainly uh, it sort of try and sort of it tried to uh and sort of tried to limit the uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons by banning a civilian mm -hmm. project. And it, mm, well, I'd say it didn't work. You know, we have, you know, since then we have um, a number of countries, most notably North Korea, right? Just mm -hmm. develop, develop their own nuclear weapons on a shoestring budget, right? right? And so, yeah, it is sort of my opinion that, uh, well, first of all, it's very hypocritical, I feel, of the U.S. to... <laughs> limit these kinds of things when it, um, when it sort of does them, does them itself on the back door. But also secondly, uh, it's counterproductive because it doesn't actually stop countries that, you know, especially dictatorships from, from doing naughty things. So, right? I mean, how do, 
how to control this, how to, to prevent this element from nuclear waste disposal from becoming something that can be dangerous to everybody or, be, or to be used as each own gang gang, you know, the leverage mm-hmm. to, to press a, against innocent people, man. You know, this is scary. And um, this is, this is it's scary. Maybe, you know, that's all I can say right now. I mean, you, you got my tongue t- tied there. <laughs> it is. And uh, I, I think I will go back to a point that you were making um, back, back then, which is sort of about okay. why um, why um, dealing with nuclear waste is diff- sort of why nuclear waste is so dangerous, and it kind of isn't, right? You have a you have um you have a lump the size of your fist, and if you keep it in a concrete box, it isn't going anywhere, right? It isn't it isn't alive. It doesn't try to crawl out of the box. But um, what makes it but uh, once you put it in the concrete box, essentially what happens is that there is um, there is a new organization called the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. Um, they will want to look at that box um, in all perpetu- in all perpetuality for um, well, not really all perpetuality, but for the ten thousand years that the plutonium is going to be there, right? Mm-hmm. Simply to make sure that you don't try and get. You don't try and fish it out. Well, this, this is what scares me because you know in, yeah. in politics, you know, people get bought mm-hmm. out, or you know, mm-hmm. which what what part of the aisle you want to stand on. This is the thing that scares me. You it know, is when you, especially when you put in, your, in in an organization and United Nations. You know, where I'm 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 personally <laughs> quite nervous on and in some yes. ways losing a lot of faith in. This is what bothers me. What also bothers mm-hmm. me is when you put some. In, in the ground someplace and some mm-hmm. natural occurrence happens that causes it to leak into the environment, whether it's an earthquake or something like that, where the shell, that, where this nuclear mm-hmm. container is kept, is cracked or something like that, then before you know, you, the, the, the cracking is out. You know, this is what scares yeah. me, man. Please, calm me well, down. Well, um, firstly, nuclear, nuclear waste doesn't leak, right? Because it isn't, it isn't green goop. It's it's solid. It's in fact a ceramic substance, kind of similar to this teacup I'm holding, right? And you know, you 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 put a teacup in your cupboard. It's not going to come out. On, it's not going to leak out of the cupboard. You smash the teacup. You're not going to breathe in teacup vapors, right? It's just going to end up in pieces on the floor, and that's kind of annoying. But you know how to deal with that. Uh, but sort of to the other point of your question, sort of the sort of the, uh, about sort of your stuff being spied upon by the IEA. Well, firstly, um, in addition to sort of all the political, uh, the historical political background uh, I mentioned earlier, this is uh, in many ways part of the reason why Taiwanese policymakers do not like nuclear energy because Taiwan isn't part of the UN, you know, and therefore not part of the IEA. Literally, um, you know, I'm hold, you know, I'm holding my Taiwanese passport. I cannot enter their headquarters in Vienna because I'm holding a Taiwanese passport, right? right? And so it is not, and so it it rubs people the wrong way. I feel if for real, Taiwan, yeah, if, if Taiwan isn't part of the isn't part of the sort of the security apparatus that. Um, sort of guards against the misuse of nuclear materials, but yet Taiwan is so sort of Taiwan is demanded to have its materials inspected by this organization, and and in fact it kind of goes deeper as well. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we have time for this, but uh, Taiwan doesn't even own its own nuclear plants. Technically, technically they're U.S. property, mm. and there's a long story behind that. <laughs> what, what's the short version of this story? Because um, uh, I don't think a lot of my friends. I, I mentioned this to a few friends, but you know they they brush it off as yeah, okay, you know Taiji Dian, yeah. you know stuff like that. Yeah, go, can you, what's the light version of that? The light version is uh, it, it works like this. Uh, Taiwan was kicked out of the UN. Uh, 
IEA wants to apply safeguards. That's what we call sort of inspection of nuclear ma materials in this way. Uh, they want to, mm -hmm. they want to um, enact safeguards. Uh, they can't do that because Taiwan is not a real country. And so what happened was the U.S. and Taiwan sort of, and, and the IEA sort of signed an agreement that for the purposes of, um, for, for the first purposes of safeguarding Taiwanese materials, um, the IEA regards Taiwanese nuclear reactors as part of the, as, as U.S. property, just under, just uh, to, to use their terminology, in the infantry of the Republic of China, so to say. Okay. And well, uh, what happened later, slightly later, was that the U.S. doesn't recognize Taiwan anymore either. And so, um, it basically that basically there is no inventory of the ROC. It's just it's just U.S. property now. <laughs> oh boy, that's kind of that's yeah. scary. And, it is, uh, and, and, and this, you know, yeah. this document can be this information can be uh, searched and brought up online. Oh yeah. Um, Okay. If you, uh, I can I can send you a link after the talk. Okay, okay. You. Well, we we add into the link. Okay, yeah, yeah. But go ahead, go ahead, continue. I'll try not yeah. to get too emotional here and, and, and cut you off. But yeah, go ahead. That's fine if you're emotional. I'm emotional. I'm just <laughs> hopefully not showing it as as much as um as much as I want to maybe. But yeah, sort of going back to what you were saying, sort of you don't you, you feel like the IEA is not trustworthy and. I feel like I, 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 I definitely agree. And I feel that um, more and more, especially with um, sort of what's happening in Ukraine and the IEA sort of response to that, uh, this is going to be more, this is going to be more and more of a problem. And uh, just to, just to end on a really, really scary note, I suppose. <laughs> um I feel that what all this demonstrates is that um, currently the rules and regulations we have for ensuring the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. doesn't work. And therefore, maybe we should just not follow those rules anymore. <laughs> you know, that, 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 from, my, from where I come from, we said that's from, from my neighborhood, that's, that's called being very ghetto. Maybe we should not... But what what do you have a, a I always when I get in conversations like this with people I always yeah. say to them when they put me in a corner okay what what do you think is a better way to do things what do you think is an alternative way that can safeguard you know mm -hmm. things and stuff like that to keep things in control or, or or under wraps or what like what bothers me is not the United Nations itself or some you know the mm -hmm. I um, the IEA it's people. Mm -hmm. who can become corrupted or influenced in some way or uh, opinionated in a certain way that's quite detrimental or controlled by external entities with other political, social political uh, uh, motive, whether it's related to, uh, you know, um, uh, finance or um, uh, uh, you know, stuff like that. You know, this is kind of scary to me. What, what, what other alternatives do we have, man? Well, um, I, I guess my, my point in saying all that, what, what I just said, is that uh, there is no keeping this on the wraps. It's not on the wraps now. We're just pretending that it is in many ways. And uh, there is, uh, there's always been a part of me that feels that maybe we should just stop pretending, right? Because it isn't doing any good. And as for your second, uh, sort of what is, what alternatives are there? Um, frankly, from my perspective, um, nothing is better. Nothing is better than what we have now, if that makes any sense. Just like if we just drop, if, if we drop, just drop all the rules, um, it would still like, um, all the, like all the un unstable autocracies in the world are still going to get their nuclear weapons as they do mm -hmm. right now. Uh, but the well-meaning countries will have access to civilian technologies that substantially improve their quality of life. Right. And as for um, what, 
like uh, sort of that's sort of a negative solution, I suppose. Sort of the more positive mm-hmm. solution for how to do things is well, hmm, speaking from sort of the very narrow perspective of being a Taiwanese. Um, first of all, uh, it it kind of doesn't matter to Tai. A lot of things don't matter to Taiwan in a lot of ways. China already has nukes. Do we really care that Iran gets nukes as well? Um, but also, secondly, uh, and as with sort of as as uh, with COVID and the WHO, uh, I feel like the Taiwan's kind of position in the world, as bad as it may be, offers a lot of opportunities for us to do things our own way and show that we can do better. And you, you know that 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 sounds pretty brave. You know, it sounds pretty brave, and um, you know, it, I, I think it should be our goal. You know, to 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 realize that mm-hmm. on, on this planet we are all we all come from one entity, mm-hmm. or you know, mm-hmm. we we I, I always say we have a lot more in common than we think. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when you're in a neighborhood of a bully or somebody's want to stick out their chest, usually it can get to a point where it's bad for everybody, even those who are watching the ruckus. And this is what I hope it doesn't turn into. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I I can understand, I can see your point, but this is, this is what I, I, I am quite fearful of mm. because, you know, I know people, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, I know people who live, you know, the neighbors next door, you know, I got good friends mm-hmm. there and here, and I don't want to see anybody, mm-hmm. In a situation where everybody gets, you know, send up a creek with no paddle, you know, mm-hmm. you know, is a lot of what you're saying to me reminds me of a Tom Cruise movie called I think it's the Officer and the Gentleman. He's in in there's a part where I think I forgot who said this, but um, oh, this fine actor, he basically said you don't want to know the truth, you don't want to hear the truth, and this is just maybe a situation where the majority of the population or those who Tramway who are put in powerful positions probably feel that the regular folks, they just don't want to hear the truth because they won't be able to sleep at night. This is, mm. this is, you know, after speaking to you, I, I feel in, in many ways like that. <laughs> yeah. And I feel that's understandable. Uh, there are times when, you know, there are times when I feel that sort of nuclear engineering uh, certainly in Ta- certainly in Taiwan and to a certain extent uh, in many places throughout the rest of the world as well doesn't have a future unless you actually live in one of those autocracies who don't care about the rules right and there was a time when I there are times when I do regret that right I wondered what will happen if you know I I wasn't paying attention or didn't trust uh, Professor Xu uh, as much all that summer you know I'd be a wind turbine engineer. Um, I'm not going to save the world, but I'm going to believe that I can. <laughs> I'd be happy. But, uh, you know, reality is harsh. And, uh, you know, you mentioned that this is, you mentioned that this talk is scary, and it is. Uh, but too bad, I'm a scary person, so. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people think I'm a scary person, too. Mm. But, you know, there's got to be, we got to make room mm-hmm. for for solutions. and yes communications and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And I'd say that um, solutions are not going to come by themselves. The, the, like so problems aren't going to go away. Solutions aren't going to present themselves by doing nothing, I feel. Uh, Taiwan, in many, many ways, uh, the current policy to abolish nuclear is to sort of is so that um, we personally do not have these problems. And I can definitely understand that, um, especially since, as I mentioned, sort of, uh, uh, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of solutions that just isn't politically viable for the Taiwan, unless we want to fight really hard for them. Uh, mm-hmm. So I sort of understand that. But at the same time, uh, just coming from my perspective as a nuclear engineer, um, it's worth fighting for because these problems aren't going to go away, right? Taiwan can swear, can, you know, 
swear off new can swear off nuclear energy and by extension nuclear weapons you know china isn't going to afford us the same courtesy neither is um anyone else we fe- we we feel might be threatening to us and mm-hmm. i feel that maybe it's time to take and i feel that uh you know it might be good to take matters into our own hands right and that might not be a bad thing i feel that yeah i i'm going to say that i'm going to say this right now um i feel that taiwan has um demonstrated leadership in many in in many areas and especially in the last two years in particular but uh and this has motivated um and i feel like this is very motivating to a lot of taiwanese people and perhaps maybe we should you know we should apply this kind of thinking to you know other areas that we haven't really previously thought about before either right? well Yes, yes. Let me pull. Let me pull the wild horses back here a little bit because yeah, sure. you know we got <laughs> the military strength of the neighbors next door, mm-hmm. the numbers of those next door that you know mm-hmm. they can push up a button and start some kind mm-hmm. of incursion mm-hmm. in Taiwan with this limited population, financial mm-hmm. and military problems is not as. This is something that we need to to really think about before proclaiming something like this in in, in out there in public. Oh, definitely. You know, you know, this is something that we can't trip over because we t- this is lives, and this is one of the red <laughs> lines that Taiwan is not supposed to trip. That mm-hmm. not many people talk about in public, and it's it's tough, and mm. maybe adds to the part of the selective amnesia that some of us have. Mm-hmm. But it's, this is a, a shaky, shaky situation, and I just wonder, you know, this could be one of the coattails that certain policymakers here are following from the West that they feel that this is something they should carry just because this equivocates them with being independent or, 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 or liberal, liberalized in some way. And this is something that I think I personally going to have to think a lot about and maybe talk to others about. And this affects Taiwan a lot because uh, for Taiwan to stand up alone on this issue will be currently, I would say, almost impossible, Daniel. Honestly, mm. uh, because a lot of contributing factors, but you know, I, it's good for me. I try to think on the on the bright side of all the time, but I also would like to hear some solutions. And um, when I can't find some solutions, what I usually do personally is sit still. And mm-hmm. um, how would the, what's the famous, uh, you know, standing? Yeah, you know, this this. Waitress, send drop, you know, maintain the, yeah. the, the political uh, status quo status right now. And, you know, uh. that's that's what bothers me. So, you know, that's that's what you put into my head. And um, this is going to cause me to not to be able to sleep well tonight. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You, you, you sort of mentioned solutions, I suppose. And uh, firstly, uh, I don't think we're ready for solutions yet, but we need to talk about solutions before we get them. And I kind of want to address kind of two points that you just made. So the one is that one is about red lines and the other is about going at it alone. Uh, so just the red lines, first of all, uh, specifically the red line from China um, is that Taiwan does not develop nuclear weapons. It does not yet talk about um, civilian restrictions that Taiwan may have. That is um, in many ways sort of the US overly broadly interpreting things to uh, not roughen the waters. And I really hate it when they do that. Uh, Yeah. But this sort of ties into the other point, which is that, uh, which is that we're going at it alone. And I don't think that that is the case. I feel that there are many, like this is, in my perspective, it is an avenue to make friends with very unconventional people, um, if we know how to do this right. Um, the closest, sort of closest both geographically uh, and hmm, I guess politically, I suppose, is South Korea. South Korea has, uh, unlike Taiwan, they haven't abandoned their, nu- they haven't 
abandon civilian nuclear development. And they've been screaming at the U.S. to allow them to reprocess their fuel uh, to, to no success at the moment. But it very much uh, – but I feel like uh, even this sort of invigorates their people to think about these kinds of things. Uh, likewise, Japan uh, – Japan also pestered, um, also pestered um, the U.S. to allow them to reprocess their fuels. And uh, their case, in their case, they were more successful because they they did they did it earlier. Frankly, uh, they demonstrate more foresight. But sort of beyond, uh, sort of beyond uh, type, sort of beyond just sort of East Asia. You know, you have we have our new friends in uh, in Eastern Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe as well. You know, the Czech Republic is a country that I feel is highly underrated in this regard. The Czech Republic is. Um, so pro nuclear, they don't have a pro nuclear movement, right? Yeah, yeah, right. They're right. yeah, the people just feel like you want energy, you go nuclear, right? And you know, there's a, I, I kind of feel like there there are a lot there are um, a lot of friends that Taiwan might be able to turn to if only we if only we ask that we're not asking right now. Yeah, but they're not a big military power. They're not a big yeah, military yeah. power. Uh, Lithuania, in this yeah. sense, and they really can't uh, send too much backup if something goes down. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I'm basically out out saying. Yeah, but hmm, I don't know. It's it's kind of part of my uh, understanding that things are going to go down no matter what. Okay, and so there are certain. So I feel like there are certain risks that are worth taking and it is better to take them now. Like Japan has done, you know, J Japan managed to, you know, Japan managed to get um, enrichment, get managed to get um, fuel creation and waste, re and, and waste recycling rights simply because they had the foresight to do it early. These things aren't going to get easier. They're going to get harder, you know? <laughs> well, you yeah. know, I, I think, there's a lot more we can talk about, but and I got a feeling we're gonna have to do this again because uh sounds like you have a lot to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a lot of things we probably didn't talk about. And I'm sure you're gonna end up getting a lot of comments below, um, uh, you know, on this topic. And I just hope you stick around the uh comment section there to uh put in your two cents. But let's let's put this uh on hold for a little bit, and I'm going to get back to you more on this because this is a really a heavy load for me, and uh, I'm going to have to take a sleeping pill tonight because of you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So, but um, you wrote uh, quite a few publications, uh, You and um, I'll mm -hmm. put them in the um, links below that people can look it up, and um, mm -hmm. uh, one in Chinese I'll put up, and uh, one in Mandarin. And um, this is, is quite interesting to me, and I, I do appreciate the time you've given me to sit down and and, uh, and chat with you. And uh, we're going to do this uh, again in the future because I have a feeling you have a lot more to say. And um, before we have, you know, <laughs> say something briefly to tell folks uh, before we hang up here. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like this is, this is a heavy topic. This is a scary topic and uh, tough, right? I've been thinking about I've been thinking about this topic uh, on and off for the last seven years, and you know I shouldn't have to bear this alone. You know, you, yeah. If I'm losing sleep, so should you guys. So, <laughs> and I general, <laughs> and I genuinely um, look forward to your comments, and I genuinely would not mind even if, um, you know, as long, I, I guess, as long as they are. Um, Constructive, even if it's just to disagree, I would very much look forward to them because I feel that at the end of the day, uh, the overwhelming problem is that this this problem is not being discussed, is it's not being talked about adequately, and uh, even if you know, even if at the even if at, at the end of the day, sort of um, it was decided that this is this is a terrible idea, we shouldn't do this. Um, it is so this decision was at least reached because there was discussion and not because everybody just kind of forgot about it. Okay. Well, you know, 
Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to do this again. And, uh, you know, thanks a lot, Daniel, for taking the time out of your morning over there in Canada. And enjoy the rest of your day. And for our viewership here, if you have any comments, you know, please leave your comments below and uh, we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. But remember, remember to stay, stay strong, safe and healthy wherever you are in the world.